Thanks, Monica. Good morning to all of you. Uh, it's great to be at the end of this project. Uh, it's been a long haul, but in some sense, it's, uh, it's a bit sad, too. This was a great group of people that came together uh, to work on something that, uh, that really hadn't been a lot of discussion of before. Uh, and I think that regardless of what you might have heard yesterday or today, uh, much of the success of this project has come already in terms of the process, the discussions, uh, you know, partnerships like GARP and, and CARBEX, which all sort of came out of the general buzz of the need to do more on developing new antibiotics. So my task today is to really talk about um, uh, the value of new uh, of antibiotics. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge first and foremost uh, John Rex, who's not here, who who uh, conceived a large, part, a large part of this project, who um, who's also my co-lead on this work package. Uh, Abby Colson, who coordinated this entire work package, and then all of the folks up there who were uh, who were key in making all of this happen. Um, now, the societal value of antibiotics is important to think about for two reasons. One is, of course, when dealing with new antibiotics, and you think, well, how much should society really invest in an antibiotic given what we get? But there's a more fundamental reason here, which is what's the value of conserving the antibiotics we already have? In some sense, antibiotics are amongst the cheapest drugs on the planet. And the question is, does the price of an antibiotic adequately reflect the value of an antibiotic, or is there a difference? If the price does not reflect the value, then perhaps we use far more antibiotics than we really should, because the price is too low. And perhaps we don't invest as much on new antibiotics because we don't reimburse companies enough for coming up with a new antibiotic because, again, the price is just too low. So both from the demand and the supply side, the fact that the price is too low can have serious consequences both for how we use the antibiotics because it's not a good signal for how valuable they are. It's also not a good signal to the market about how important it is to develop new antibiotics. So, uh, so that's why this was important to do. Now, of course, there's resistance costs, which is, you know, using an antibiotic selects for resistance, but there's also a transmission benefit, which is, you know, if you use antibiotics, then perhaps, uh, you know, there's less of the, uh, the infection going around. Now, antibiotics provide benefits that other drugs don't. In some sense, they're fundamentally like, you know, their own class when it comes to, uh, comes to reimbursement. The first value they have is called enablement value. You heard about it in the very first talk yesterday, which is they make possible, uh, you know, surgical procedures, transplants, and so forth. So the fact that much of the medical system depends on effective antibiotics needs to be captured in some way. A second value is in the, in the sense that antibiotics provide an insurance value in the case of very small probability but high impact events. One potential event, which I'll talk about in a bit, is a pandemic flu with secondary bacterial infections. We know that the 1918 flu pandemic uh, incurred a lot of mortality because of, of the secondary bacterial infections for which back in 1918 there were no antibiotics. Today we may return to a similar state even though we have antibiotics but because that secondary bacterial infection is multidrug resistant. Now, a third value is diversity value, which is imagine if the entire world only had one antibiotic to use, right? So, which means that resistance is going to grow really fast. If there was a second antibiotic that could be brought to the table, then what that does is reduce our reliance on the first antibiotic, but in that sense provides a value to society because it, re it reduces the risk of resistance uh, tremendously. So this has been you know, uh, written about a fair bit in terms of uh, not having, having multiple first-line treatments in the case of malaria, for instance. And to some extent, this also captures the idea of combinations. When you do combinations, what you're really doing is, is you're adding diversity because the chance that that bug has two keys or is it simultaneously able to unlock two locks is much, greater, much lower than being able to take care of just one lock. Now, I also want to set some context here. Although we're all extremely worried about drug resistance, the numbers today are still really small. Now, I'm not going to walk through this full example, but even if you start off with a large number of bacterial infections every day on the planet, it is still an exceedingly small number of them, a small proportion of them, not a small number, a small proportion of them that is drug resistant, which means that the number of deaths from resistant pathogen, one to two million, is a large number, but that's because it's starting off of a very large uh, denominator of, of the you know, potentially seven billion infections. So even though resistance is an important problem, 
most bacterial infections, and I say really the, the preponderance of them, they will not require new antibiotics at all. You know, we still are facing up against uh, the challenge that any company that comes up with a new antibiotic is still competing against 200 existing antibiotics that more or less work. Uh, of course, it's now less rather than more, but still the fact is they're all out there. And this challenge is how can that drug that comes in meet exactly the patient who has that highly multi-drug resistant infection and therefore we're able to charge the right value for that particular infection. That's very hard, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Now, of the three values, I think enablement value is an important one. It's particularly important both in developed countries where there's a large elderly population and, you know, of course, uh, you know, I guess some of us, uh, well, all of us at some stage are going to go through some of these procedures. And uh, we, we did this estimation first, first for the U.S. and then we're doing it now for, for Europe. If you look at the 10 most common surgical or chemotherapy procedures that require antibiotics, the absolute risk reduction from having an effective antibiotic is not trivial. It's somewhere between 5 and 25 percent. And this was uh, published a couple of years ago. And if you really look at the mortality rate of infected patients, again, it's not small. And these are all from clinical trials, published literature, uh, all from very well done, done studies. And if you see the numbers of procedures every year in the US is not small. There's 1.3 million uh, you know, C-sections. And even if it's only a small number that has infections and that could be drug resistant, that's still putting a lot of women at risk. Uh, so again, we looked at the proportion of infections that were caused by the pathogens that were resistant to standard prophylaxis, and that again is, you know, uh, pretty high numbers of resistance at this stage. And from that, we estimated about 120,000 additional infections every year because of first-line antibiotics being about 30 percent less effective at prophylaxis than they were before. And this was roughly sort of, you know, the reduction that we're seeing in efficacy. And we estimated about 6,000 additional de deaths each year. Now, these are obviously model-based estimates based on published literature. So, you know, there's uncertainty bounds around them. But nevertheless, this number is only going to go up over time. And 6,000 additional deaths is not trivial. So if you take a value of a statistical year, that ends up in, you know, billions of dollars. Uh, and this number is also, uh, you know, likely to be increasing in, in developing countries as there's a growing elderly population. If you look at number of post-biopsy infections from uh, fluoroquinolone resistance, the current estimate is about, you know, it's about 30,000 additional infections, but that again can go up to about 80,000 as, as uh, the easier antibiotics get more resistant. Now, the second value is that of insurance. Now, insurance is something that we all understand really well, which is you pay for something and you hope to never have to cash in on it. Uh, you know, for instance, your house burning down or your car being in an accident. But if it does happen, then someone stands ready to pay for it. Uh, in many ways, our investment in antibiotics, whether cons conserving existing antibiotics or investing in new ones, is purchasing insurance. It's pur purchasing insurance for, for events that we might not have seen even in our lifetimes, but if they were to happen, would cause extreme uh, economic losses. And they don't have to be large events either. You don't need to have millions of people die. Uh, if you recall, September 11, 2001, then followed by the anthrax, uh, you know, attacks in, 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 or, uh, you know, the, the anthrax uh, events in the United States, the fact that there was a broad spectrum antibiotics that was available was itself valuable at that particular point in time that, you know, Cipro could be easily given out and therefore it had value in dealing with, with what could have been, a, you know, a, a really worrisome event. Even if only a few hundred people were to die, SARS, for instance, only a thousand deaths, but caused hundreds of billions of dollars in economic losses, that could be dealt with if we had effective antibiotics. Now, uh, John Rex and, and Kevin Arderson had written a paper which, uh, you know, likens it to, uh, to having firefighting infrastructure, which is you hope never to use it, but you should be paying for fire equipment so that when there is a fire, someone shows up to, uh, to put it down. Now, this particular value of antibiotics has just not been explored very much. Uh, there's lots of papers on vaccines and, uh, and, you know, social distancing and school closures and all of that on how to deal with pandemic flu. 
But if you take the reason why mortality rates were high in the 1918 pandemic flu, which is the secondary bacterial infections, then uh, we know almost nothing about the value of antibiotics in dealing with these, uh, with these particular events. That's what we did here. So we have a poster out there, poster number 12 apparently, which is we're looking at two values, which is withholding wide use of broad spectrum antibiotics until a pandemic occurs, or you immediately begin using an, a broad spectrum oral antibiotics. Essentially, you develop an antibiotic and then you either are keeping it for a period of time, stockpiling it, or you're using it immediately. And this, in a summary, is the result, uh, which is the value of having that antibiotic being available to us at any given point in time just to take, uh, you know, just to be able to use when, if there is a pandemic is, uh, you know, upwards about $2.5 billion. And uh, it's, you know, it can be as high as, you know, in the tens of billions of dollars as you get further th to the right. On the x-axis is the percentage of secondary infection resistance strains, which is, you know, 10%, 15%. These are extremely plausible numbers. I mean, these are, we probably exceed these already. So we're already out there on, in terms of, uh, of uh, you know how important the secondary infections might be and you know whether they're resistant or not and they're entirely consistent with what we've seen in earlier flu pandemics and of course you have the hazard rate as well which is the risk of having such an event happen at all and uh, you know of all the catastrophic events whether it's being hit by an asteroid or uh, or having you know one of those uh, CERN reactors essentially reduce the entire planet to the size of this podium in one second you know that's possible right so um, <laughs> it's true uh, but uh, anyway, you know, all, all of those are possible events, but I think a flu pandemic is, is highest on that, on that list. At least in the, if we're all reduced to the podium, then none, none of us would even know, right? There's no one left to grieve after that, so it's fine. The third one is, is the diversity value. Now, diversity value, like I mentioned, uh, has been a lot more part of the discussion when it comes to antimalarial drugs because typically we've used antimalarial drugs one after the other, you know, with the whole world getting the same antimalarial drug. Fortunately, we've had diversity in, in antibiotics, uh, antimicrobials. So um, uh, for bacterial infections, so you, what, what, although we didn't, you know, we don't have a paper per se on this, we've done, you know, some crude estimates. And what this really depends upon is the number of therapeutic options that we have and the extent to which these can be displaced by a new antibiotic. Now, uh, turns out that the diversity value of a new antibiotic unless it's for a very, very specific instance, you know, potentially, or these are very, you know, I think they're outside of the range of possibilities, the diversity value is not gonna be high. So this was not something we anticipated at the outset, but the diversity value is just not gonna be high in that a new antibiotic is gonna come in, displace a bunch of existing antibiotics, and therefore reduce the risk of infection, uh, of, of resistance. So, um, but that said, it gives us some idea of where the biggest values will come from. I think. The, the insurance value is gonna be really high, the enablement value, you know, slightly less so, but still high, and then third is, is the diversity value. So we try to combine all of this into some sort of advice for HTA processes. So health technology assessments, as you all know, is the process by which many countries, particularly in Europe, with single payer systems, assess whether uh, you know an antibiotic should be introduced or any drug should be introduced or not. Uh, in the United States, we've you know uh, we actually have uh, legislation that bans the use of HDA type processes, so there's no risk of this uh, you know corrupting any sort of rational decision making there. But uh, in the in Europe, obviously, you know, NICE is a good example of, of how this happens, and of course, uh, you know, the WHO is, has published on this as well. There are no guidelines or methods that are specific to antibiotics, which is absolutely crazy. Antibiotics fundamentally are different. I mean, they engender resistance, and the fact that I use antibiotics has implications for your ability to use them has to be incorporated into the value of antibiotics in some way, and. And uh, I don't know if there's anyone here from an HTA agency, but I believe that some are already thinking about it. This is where we think that the greatest economic incentive to developing new antibiotics can come from, from having reimbursement actually be pegged to the real value of antibiotics and not just to a, you know, a marginal cost of producing them, whatever it is. Now, the recommendations are, of course, you know, include a sensitivity analysis of the impact of resistance to the new antibiotic over time. Uh, I don't know if anyone's doing that yet, but you know, this is something that should be on the radar. 
analysis should it happen at the population level. Now, there might be rules that actually prevent that from happening at a population level. Most drugs are evaluated at the individual level. That is, again, a constraint for how the FDA, for instance, looks at new antibiotics. This is a problem. If you don't look at population health, uh, when it comes to a new therapeutic, then we miss out both on these kinds of societal values. We also omit, for instance, the potential damage done to an antibiotic by using it in the environment or for growth promotion or what have you. And then the third is, in addition to the direct costs and benefits, where relevant, we look at you know, the transmission reduction benefits and then also diversity value. I said the diversity value is low, but again, you know, it's something which needs to be incorporated. So we took an example of carbapenem-resistant acinetobacter, uh, acinetobacter, and uh, you know, it's obviously an important uh, uh, problem out there today. Uh, and uh, uh, Brad Spellberg and John Rex had conducted a cost-effectiveness analysis where they focused just on the direct benefits and found these to be significant. But what we did was we extended that to include the indirect benefits, which makes it even more valuable to have. I'm not going to go through this example. It's in a poster out there. But essentially, the top part is all of the, the total costs, the direct benefits and qualities. But you also include the transmission benefits and the diversity benefits. Uh, and they add quite significantly. You can see the transmission benefits can be more uh, significant than the direct benefits even. And you add the diversity benefits, which though smaller are important. And you can, have, uh, you can make a case for new antibiotics being actually very cost effective to produce. Uh, and, and to be able to justify, you know, the prices that we pay for these. So uh, let me s stop by saying that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not as if this is an argument necessarily for making antibiotic prices higher. That's not what it is. But at the end of the day, price signals are very important. If the price of gasoline were only 10 cents a gallon, then our incentives to conserve gasoline are going to be far less than if it's an appropriate price. And prices are important signals for the entire system in terms of how seriously we take something. That does not mean that we then use it as an excuse to deny people who need antibiotics the antibiotics. I think we need to construct other mechanisms, social insurance and so forth, to make sure that people are able to get the antibiotics that they need, even if it costs thousands of dollars a dose or even more than that. And I suspect we will see that in our lifetimes. That's a different problem. But we cannot solve the problem of antibiotic resistance unless we recognize the value that they truly bring to us. And um, I think that's an important part of this puzzle. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ramadan, please stay. Um, I think we'll have time to take um, a couple of questions. Hi there, uh, Mark Johnson from MSD UK. Um, just a quick one on the predictability of resistance. Um, payers obviously are <laughs> chasing certainty, as we all are. We've done some work here that would suggest that you can look at sort of scenarios of resistance, sort of 10%, 20, 30, and then look at the cost on the health system for those scenarios. But it's very hard to then work out how likely those scenarios are likely to take place. So I guess just a pretty simple question. How feasible do you think it is to project out for new agents resistance trends into a 15, 20, 25 year horizon? So that's the next talk, which I won't get into. But let me also say that as part of our work, Abby, which, what's your poster number? 14, maybe? Somewhere between 12 and 15. Uh, there's also some work we've done using structured expert judgment, which is on quantifying uncertainty about those trajectories, which is really what your question is. How certain can you be? There's a poster out there that answers your question exactly by bug drug combination. So otherwise, Abby is up in front, and she's the person who did that research. Yes, question over here. Yeah. Uh, Gopal Rao from Nautic Park, London. Uh, I was very fascinated to hear you talking about the value of antibiotics. What about the value of conservation of antibiotics? Has any qualities been done about that? Uh, and prevention of infection? You know, this is the same, two sides of the same coin. So everything that I said here applies as much to conservation as it does to new antibiotics. Because if I can get the same effectiveness of antibiotics by conserving the ones that I have, 
rather than developing new ones, that's equally worthwhile. So I think... Uh, so would it be the same value of 3,000 odd pounds for conservation or will be far greater than that? Well, you have to work it out as a value per dollar spent on conservation. We're actually doing some work on this, which is on, it depends on the cost of conservation. Uh, a stewardship program, for instance, just very crudely, is something in the order of about, you know, five to six dollars per patient bed day in the United States. The cost of infection prevention is about 10 to 15 dollars. At those prices, absolutely worthwhile to, to be paying that amount of money. That's very reassuring. Thank yeah. you very much. Belgium. Very nice presentation. Uh, one point that you didn't address is the problem of the generics. Generics are pushing the price very, very low. And so that's where the situation is that now most of the time people confuse global cost and acquisition cost. But most of the time they rely on acquisition cost and therefore the price is so low that it completely disinterests the industry on the one hand, but also makes the antibiotic not another value. Can you address that? Well, that's a really important and tough question, and as expected from you always, a profound one. Uh, see, unless we are able to set up a structure for making sure that the millions of people in developing countries who don't even have access to antibiotics today, even at these low prices, will be able to get them if the prices were a little higher, unless we have that piece also sorted out, uh, it would be hard to then make a case for bringing the genetics into line. What I wish, if I could wave a magic wand, I would say that we really should do something about the genetics and make sure that they are not pushed as hard and that the prices are reflecting the value of antibiotics more than just the cost of producing them. I mean, this is the same as with oil. Today, what we pay for oil is the cost of, of just extracting them from the ground. We're not really paying the true cost of you know, all of the environmental damages and all of that. And how do we do that? We impose taxes on oil. That's how we impose the cost of, of, of the local air pollution, the climate change, the carbon tax, and all of that. We have to do the same for antibiotics, but in the same way as you know, we do other things for people who are not able to afford the gasoline, we've got to make these, you know, bring in other structures as well. But without a doubt, the genetics are a major problem here. <laughs>